Hello, everybody. I am Danielle Love, founder of the Sacred Sexual Energy Body of Work, and you may also know me as the founder of Diabetes Dominator Coaching Practice. Today, I am here with a completely new interview series. Although you may know me have interviewing like 300 plus people, I'm having a whole new topic and it is really giving me life and passion. And Ebony here is going to be my first guest who I'm so blessed to have with me today. I'm going to read you a very short bio about Ebony so you can kind of get a little gist and then we're just going to get right into the real life sex talk because that's what this is here on Real Life Sex. We're educating, we're healing, we're empowering people to set up their lives in the ways in which serve them, not asking for permission from anyone else about how they need to live their lives. So, Ebony Turk is an unapologetically Black woman born and raised on the South Side of Chicago. She is an optimistic, positive, passionate leader in her community, a gifted guidance counselor, and a truth teller and seeker. Okay. Ebony connected with her passion through HIV, has been working in the HIV community for over 15 years. After finding out she contracted HIV in 2001 and not handling it well for four years, she was led to therapy, which helped her overcome internal and external stigma. It also helped her discover some amazing qualities in herself that led to the community work she does now. Ebony, thank you so much for being here. How is it going for you today? Good, good. I am excited to be here. I can't wait to talk about um, real life sex stories in my yes. life. <laughs> yes, because I just heard from Ebony before this that she is a gifted storyteller. And really, as far as humanity goes, in my opinion, there's not much that connects us better than storytelling. So I'm excited. I don't even know any of these stories. So let's just uh, find this stuff out uh, together. <clears throat> so your bio gave a little background. Would it be okay for you to kind of, uh, in your own storytelling fashion, talk about the path you started 15 years ago when you found out you contract HIV, the stigma that you've experienced that we all know is out there, and how you kind of got here where you are? And I know that could be long. I don't care. Speak your mind because we want to hear how you got from A to B because we're here and I'm excited. So um, about... 23, four years ago, I fell in love <laughs> with a man. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> yes. Um, fell in love in my early 20s. I was doing well. Like I was um, a computer programmer, a computer teacher. So I was like living my best life. I had one son um, and fell in love with a man. And we had um, like we were inseparable. Um, we were young. We didn't really have a, a car and living in Chicago. You don't really need a car because of public transportation. So he used to walk me to the bus stop, pick me up when I get out of work, be at the bus stop waiting on me, like inseparable. Like we were always together except when we had to work. So um, anyway, we, we lived like that life like that for a few years, um, uh, enjoying love and each other. And um Eventually, we decided he had one son. I had one son. We were together for three years. Um, it was good. Like, no major beefs, arguments, none of that. We were just enjoying each other's company. So we decided we wanted to have a kid together because we were dope together. So we dope together. We wanted to have this dope kid. So um, in order to, uh, I should back up and say, because I was a teen parent, I believed in wearing condoms. Didn't want to have no more kids. I'm just going to interject and say, I'm not a parent and I have an ethical non-monogamous marriage. And one of our biggest rules, no matter what, no matter how close we get to anyone, condoms are non, like you cannot not wear a condom. That's one of our agreements between my husband and I like that. So I, I hear that and I support yeah. that. Yeah. So we were, um, for all those years, we, we would have a mistake here. And I'm not a mistake. We would have a slip up here, slip up there it, without wearing it, but not, not nothing major. So pretty much the whole three years we used um, protection. Um, and when we just, when we sat down and decided to have this baby, which is the only time I've ever done that, <laughs> um, we stopped using condoms. And about three months in, I started getting sick and dizzy and breast hurting. And just so I went, I made an appointment with my primary care physician. And um, 
she did a pregnancy test. Um, and she said, you're not pregnant. She said, but uh, she did a blood test, a blood draw. She said, you're not pregnant, but your white blood cells are low. So I want to give you an HIV test. And I said, oh, what? <laughs> Why would you want to give me that? I've been with one man. We've been using condoms this whole time. She's like, just let's do it. And I was like, okay, let's do it, whatever. So we did it. I came back in two weeks. Um, and she said, your test was positive. And I said, wait, what does that mean? Positive means positive or positive means I got it or I don't get it. She was like, you had it. I, I, I will never forget sitting in that room. Um, and it like everything went black. It was just like a sea of blackness. And she kept talking and I heard her, but I didn't hear. Her. I just was thinking about all of the things. My biggest thing I was thinking about, like I was the good girl growing up in my family, like never got any trouble. Everybody loved me, like good girl. So now I got to go home and tell my family that I live, I, I got HIV and the things that I hear them say about um, people living with HIV in the community and out their mouths, I don't want to tell nobody this. So I was devastated. I made a plan to leave there and kill myself. Um, I actually told my, I was showing my friends yesterday the uh, place where it was, where I got diagnosed in the wall that I was going to run my car into to try to kill myself. Um, Thank God you didn't do that. Yeah, no, I got, God had a plan for me because I tried three times. Anyway, <laughs> um, that didn't happen. I went home. Now, I had, I was staying with my, my mother, but I pretty much lived at his house because we were always together. So I didn't go home to him. I went to my mama's house and went in my room and tore it up because I was angry and I needed to get the anger out. Um, my mother asked me what was wrong with me. I told her I had just got diagnosed with brain cancer. <laughs> Oh <laughs> sorry. No, sorry I mean, everybody who has it. No, but what the thing is is that I from living with type 1 diabetes and I know they're not the same disease, but as far as diabetes is there's a huge stigma, especially with all it's like you eat too much sugar, you you don't care about your health, you deserve this, you did this to yourself. So I totally understand just generally having a stigma placed upon you because you live with a disease that you didn't do anything to get like you weren't there was no like no one said oh yeah like yeah. so I get that and it's just to me it's it's funny like I, I believe and I'm glad you're laughing about it because I believe we all have we have to laugh about everything because how else can we really deal with life um but I'm not like my mom lives with cancer I'm not mad that you said like it's just interesting how the brain itself will just be like let me just throw out any old thing that sounds super serious, but it's not actually the thing. Like, it's just, I'm kind of glad that we can. I said brain yeah. cancer because I grew up with, I, as a child, I grew up with my, migraine headaches. So okay. I was like, that didn't make sense for her. Okay. But so anyway, I told her that and um, then told, you know, told her I didn't want to be bothered with anybody and she left me alone. So anyway, went from that learning that I had it to I never talked to him again by the way wow I told him what I knew I asked him did he know he said he didn't I was angry at him but I never went back I never spoke to him again because I had to I was dealing with my own stuff and for folks who might be wondering about that aspect of it thinking back on it now do you did were you able to think of any maybe symptoms or ways in which he was acting that may have given you clues now that you have all this time and perspective to look back on it and if so could you share what that might be for folks yes that was that's a great question looking back on it he always had um colds okay he always was catching colds or whatever um or what appeared to be colds because mm -hmm. actually symptoms of hiv can't appear to be a bad cold Mm -hmm. um and he never went to the doctor that is a surefire way to not deal with nobody if they don't go to the doctor you probably shouldn't red flag yeah <laughs> yes mm -hmm. um and he had a job and he had insurance but he never went to the doctor and that's just the thing with me and me don't like going to doctors so. sure but he also um, might have um, known and that's the thing like now that you look back that's another sign yeah. that he probably knew something was up and he just wasn't going to deal with it. 
Yeah. Exactly. So, um, yeah, so that happened. And then, like, I just tried to continue to live my life like I was normally limited, living it with the secrets. It was a secret at this point. I actually told my best friend, who is also my cousin, she was the only person that knew. I told her she tried to help me because it, I was depressed. Like I stayed, I went to work, but you know, functional depression, went to work, came home in my room, cried. Um, two weeks later, they put me on medicine, 16 pills twice a day. And the pills were huge. Mm. So, um, and this is from a person who didn't even take pills for headaches that I had migraines as a child or menstruation cramps and I had bad bad men like I did not take medicine mm. I didn't like it so I ended up having to take 16 pills twice a day for this 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 disease that was living with me now um that didn't go well that's the second time I tried to commit suicide because I was like I can't do this so I took all the pills like a dummy <laughs> mm. all they did was give me <laughs> Yeah, so that was the second time. So, um, yeah, so anyway, I moved to Alabama because I was like, okay, I can't kill myself. So let me leave all of the people that I know and go to a state where don't nobody know me. Although I had a few family members there and I actually was moving in with my godparents, they weren't going to ask me no questions. So I was like, let me just leave. So I left and went to Alabama um and was fine was you know me and my son were you know living life or whatever and I went my mom my mother had a apartment fire in Chicago so I went home to help her move and all of that stuff while there um there was a guy and this was this has been three years at this point I was a guy that always tried to date me um and I was talking to him like every day in Alabama, we were just talking. I felt it was safe to talk to him in a different state <laughs> and nothing would come of it. So anyway, went home, the fire happened. I needed somewhere to stay because my, of course I couldn't stay with my mother and uh, my mother needed somewhere to stay. So I was trying to get her place. And um, I asked, and he said, he asked me, he said, you can come stay with me if you want to. So I went and stayed with him while I was in Chicago and um, I told him about my HIV. He was the first person. And well, outside of my cousin, he was the right. first guy. And um, he was like, oh, he was like, you know, he's like, that's cool. He was like, you're on your medicine. And he worked at a hospital, so he knew about it. I was like, yeah, I'm taking my medicine and I'm, you know, I'm okay. I was like, it's just, it is what it is. So anyway, as the days went back for me staying with him, he liked me. Like we wanted to date. So um it got spicy and um I hadn't had sex in three years <laughs> so he was like he knew and he was like it's okay we can wear a condom I was like yeah we could and it was cool so we had sex and then I go home and about four months later I started throwing up everything and I'm thinking it's my medicine so I'm at the doctors they doing tests they sticking things down my throat, trying to figure out what's happening. Cause I am, I'm like, I ain't had no sex in years. And I, that's sex I just had with a condom. So I know I'm not pregnant. Cause my doctor asked, are you pregnant? I was like, uh -uh. and then it was so long. Like it was like three or four months after that happened that I started having these symptoms. So um, they doing all these tests and I found nothing. I done, I've been back to the doctor like three or four times. So one night I had to go to the emergency room because I was just too, I was throwing up so bad. I couldn't function. First thing they do in the emergency room is give you a pregnancy test, no matter what you say. <laughs> so they gave me a pregnancy test and then, sit, and then she was sending me to x-ray to get an x-ray. Mm. Doctor come running down the hall. Stop! She pregnant! I told the man, I said, keep going. She ain't talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> she's not talking about me <laughs> so she got up to me and uh she said you pregnant that's why you throwing up I was like what 
another like smacking the like I like the breath went out of me like what so went home call him and he was like yeah I took the condom off uh, he was like it was feeling so good I just wanted to feel how it felt without the condom off so I was like what what <laughs> that's how I'm like what what is okay I'm, I'm just gonna be quiet let you continue yep so <laughs> I just hung up and was like okay I'm gonna have to my plan was to get an abortion because I did not want to one I didn't know anything about what my first thought was I'm not bringing no kid in this world living with H with HIV that was my first thought and um I really didn't even want another kid like at that point, I, I didn't want another kid because I'm traumatized by trying to have a kid and getting HIV. So I, I didn't mean, want another kid. Understandable. <laughs> so um, so I go to the doctor in Alabama and the doctor told me, you have two choices. She said, you either figure out a way to keep your medicine down um, because when you when people live with HIV don't take their medicine, the virus um, kind of rises in your blood. And it makes you sicker. That's how people get sick and die if they don't take medicine because the virus attacks your immune system. Mm -hmm. But if you take your medicine and suppresses the virus in your in your body and pretty much kills it off mm -hmm. to where it's not even detectable. So you can your immune system can function and survive. The baby wasn't letting me take my medicine. So um, I was sick. My my virus was high. Um and my body was weak because I couldn't, like, my son wasn't right. Ready. You couldn't eat, do nothing, like, eat, yeah. drink, nothing. Yeah. So she was like, You either gonna die, or, and she said, If you get an abortion, you probably gonna die in a procedure, which was horrible. She shouldn't have told me that. Well, I was, that's a horrifying horrible. thing for horrible. a doctor to horrible. say. And I can't even tell you how many times I've had discussions with folks, and I've been navigating the medical community my entire life and have doctors. And again, I'm not putting a blanket over all doctors, but a lot of doctors say things that are so out of line, that are so influential to the patient that looks at them as if they're in some position of authority. Like when my mom got diagnosed with cancer, I said to any of the doctors, I was like, if you say anything about a time that you think she has available to live, you're going to be in a, a world of trouble. Your whole entire life is going to get turned upside down. I essentially threatened them. Like, you do not know. My mom's been living with stage four pancreatic cancer for two years, and she's literally driving home from Florida, from Philadelphia by herself. She's chilling. So do yeah. not impose your book knowledge on what you think is going to happen. Uh, yeah, that just got me mad. So, That's exactly true. You're mm, exactly right. No. Um, <laughs> Luckily, I had enough sense to know that there were there was better health care and I wasn't accepting at that point I wasn't accepting death. No. I was like, I'm not just gonna accept I'm gonna die either way. So in sitting in that clinic, um, I actually made an appointment at my hospital in Chicago because I was like, it there gotta be a better way than yeah. this. So I actually moved back to Chicago, went to the doctor, um my doctor was like, you okay? You ain't got a, the doctor in Chicago. He was like, he was like, you okay? He's like, yeah, you too far along for abortion now. He was like, but you okay to have a baby? He said, you don't have to take your medicine until the third trimester. The medicine will like suppress the virus in your blood within two weeks. You'll be able to have a baby safely. He's like, women live with HIV, have babies without without them getting HIV these days. He was like, it's no big deal. I was like, what? I was like, that lady just committed me to death and you telling me mm. to you. That's a beautiful yeah. example of always getting a second, third, fourth, however many opinions you need to get. And so what feels like what the gut feeling that you have, that you think you just need somebody else to help you justify it, keep looking. I'm yeah. so glad you did. Absolutely. So went on, um, pregnant, um, uh, 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 <laughs> a, a difficult pregnancy, way more difficult than my first child, um, because my son literally would only allow me to eat like hot wings, flaming hots, ice, and tomatoes. Like it was weird. That's the only thing I could eat to keep down. 
And um, I lost 30 pounds um, because I wasn't eating a lot. I almost lost my teeth. <laughs> uh, and then I'm thinking, oh, Lord, this baby is going to be small and frail and sickly because I'm small. I'm, I'm frail and sickly right now. The boy came out, he's 10 pounds. Mm-hmm. He was getting all my stuff. <laughs> he was taking everything from me. <laughs> so I had him HIV negative. Um, actually, and the, the, one of the things I should say is his first HIV test after we got home, because they give them a series of tests um, throughout an 18-month period to make sure HIV doesn't come up in their system. So he took a test in the hospital. Uh, we sat in the hospital for three days. He took a test in the hospital. Yeah. And then we came home. Um, when, when, he came, when we left, they gave him another test. So that test came back positive and they were calling me and they were calling me and they were calling me, get back to the hospital right now. And I was like, Lord Jesus. So I, we went back to the hospital to do another test and um, that test came back negative and all the rest of his tests came back negative. So that one positive, positive test was the test picked up my, you know, when you have a baby, the baby um, has your immune system on their on them or in them or whatever sure. for a week or something, and it sheds its immune, your immune system over time or something. And they said the test was picking up from my HIV. Okay. So um, thank God he was negative. Um, what I, I, I also you have to give your baby medicine for the first three months of to make you know to they just want to be really certain preventative measures sure of course that the kids don't get it so um yeah so all of that happened and um really quickly a big part of something that happened was when I moved back home I had to move back in with my mother I had a brother living there she had her boyfriend living there um they researched my medicine and found out about my status. They, that's, they, in, they, you know, the internet was, we had, it was new and they figured out how to use Google. Mm-hmm. It wasn't Google back then, but mm-hmm. <laughs> they figured out how to use whatever it was and researched it. And they had kept it a secret for a while that they knew. But one night we had a, we were at me and um, my mom's boyfriend, I think. No, what was it? My brother, me and somebody was having a disagreement and it came out that we know you you had your HIV status and I was like oh Jesus so I still denied and I was like whatever you're lying whatever whatever and we had a big blowout I ended up getting put out um and well everybody ended up getting put out (laughs) because I think yeah everybody ended up getting put out me my me and my brother and um I pretty much was homeless at that point because now they know they talking about my HIV status um and I just was shame and I was angry or whatever so I was homeless for about a week and a half I slept in emergency rooms I slept on the train I slept on buses stuff like that until my one of my other brothers was like girl <laughs> and I had friends and people I could ask it was just I I was very prideful you were and in I a did, yeah and you're in a rough yeah. space yeah and I didn't want to yeah. impose on anybody I was the, the internal stigma was telling me if they know like my, the reason why I didn't tell my mama is because I love her I love my mama to death I still love her but she tell people you know how mamas get on the phone and tell your auntie and the auntie tell like it spread so I was like if they know if she know, then everybody know. know. So I didn't want to deal with that. So I didn't ask anybody anything because I was very proudful. But my brother found out what I was doing and he was like, um, come stay with me. But before that, one night I was in when I was sleeping in a, a hospital bit, it's hospital room, hospital emergency room. I seen my case manager. So you get a case manager when you're living with HIV to make sure you're taking your medicine and all that. And I just had a baby and all that. So um she um I mean I was pregnant at that time she said you know there are housing programs for people living with HIV let's sign you up for some whatever so she did that um fast forward 
I was able to get some housing. Um, with this housing uh, came a you know, fully furnished apartment um, with everything I needed. Um, and you, they required you to get therapy. I okay. had, cause that was going to be the question. I'm like, what, cause that was in your thing. When did the therapy come in the kind of like that turning point and how that was going to be a question. Yeah. How did you get there? So I'm so glad. Yeah. yeah. So they require you to get therapy. And at this point they had offered it to me up, but I always said no, because I just, in my family, I've always heard therapy is not good. Like my mom used to always be like, they just gonna blame me. Another stigma, <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, I dodged the therapist as much as I could until she knocked on my door. So she knocked on my door and, you know, I was like, okay, you know, you here, we can talk. That's fine. So we started therapy in my home. She, she came to my house every week and we started therapy. Um, the simplest question she asked me, which kind of was a turning point was one, she said, who takes care of you right now? And even before this, I was always very independent. You know, I had to stay with my mom a few times, but I was always making my own money and can take care of myself. So I was like, nobody. I was, and especially now, you know, I, I have my own apartment and stuff. I was like, nobody takes care of me now. Um, you know, nobody pays my bills. She said, so if you tell somebody what's going to happen. And I said, well, they won't love me anymore. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, why won't they love you anymore? I said, because now I have this disease. She said a disease that they can only get if they're having sex with you or, you know, if you're, you're healthy. She said, if any of these people, are you having sex with any of these people? I said, no, like my family and, you know, my fans and family is really huge to me and has always been. So she was like, if your family doesn't love you after you tell them this, a thing that they can't get. Um, she said, does that mean they really love you? Mm, now that's a good question. And I said, hmm, I said, you're right. <laughs> I said, if I tell them and they don't want to be around me or they don't love me no more, that's I mean, not love. In the first place. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay. And I said with that, you know, we continue therapy, but moving forward, um, I started doing when she, I, she actually opened up a gate to me, expanding my mind and expanding my heart in order to make my life better. So I started to learn about HIV. I started going to classes. I started, um, you know, participating in groups, things like that. Finding um, community, right? Yes, yeah. finding community. So eventually, um, I started, I want to say I started a support group or something. People discovered me. Sure. And they wanted to, this organization called um, Test Positive Awareness Network in Chicago wanted to do a story on me. And they asked me if, you know, if I would be interviewed. And I said, sure. Well, they made me the cover girl. So I was the, on the front page. And I said, Lord, I said, I can't. This, and it's a nationwide magazine. I said, I, I don't want my family to find out about me living with HIV like this. Because that's rude. <laughs> so unfortunately, my auntie had died within the time that before the magazine came out. And I said, I will use the funeral. I'll use this time for us to be together to tell everybody. So after the repass, when everybody kind of got together, I got, I told everybody I needed to make an announcement and I actually had the magazine. It hadn't went out nationally yet, but I had it. So I took it with me and um, I told everybody, um, confirmed it pretty much (laughs) with everybody that I was living with HIV and, um, they all was like, you know, they was like, we still like, we love you and all that very supportive. And it was, you know, a love fest from then on. Um, that, um, freed me. Yeah. I always tell people it's like a bunch of, um, bricks on my back. It was like a bunch of bricks, like a building on my back. And as soon as like with therapy, some start falling. Um, as I started learning things, some start falling. 
And then when I told my family, it was like the whole building fell because those were things that I was kind of holding um, as stressors, as stigma, as problems. And as I eliminated those problems, um, it, it started falling and it freed me, yeah. freed me to live the life um, that I should be living. And that you're living now, right? Yes. And that so, now. <laughs> so you, that was, so was that magazine cover and that interview, was that kind of your entrance point into the advocacy work that you're doing now? And kind of, um, can you talk a little bit about the advocacy work that you're doing now? Because all disease states need passionate advocates that are actually representative of the community that they're representing. So can you tell a little bit about the work you do now and how you help other people from your own struggle? Sure. So, um, you know, now I do, um, well, I was doing policy and advocacy work um, within an organization that is for women living with HIV, ran by women living with HIV called Positive Women's Network USA. Um, and what we do is um, help women live with HIV, um, learn leadership and policy and advocacy skills to um, pretty much improve the lives of people living with HIV. So there are a lot of, you know, laws and policies and things that don't help us live our best life so we fight to make sure that those things um that we either get those things or we let people know that those things is a problem um health care um reproductive rights which actually just got taken away in um texas which is where my primary residence is i'm from chicago but i live in texas um reproductive rights just got taken away from there so we fight we you know we federal level, state level, local level, we do advocacy with, within our legislatures to try to help that. I also do um, talks to try to em- empower other people living with HIV to be healthy, live healthy, get in care and live their best lives. Let them know that, you know, although contracting HIV is not the ideal situation that you can live Um, a healthy, um, free, beautiful life with it. Like it's not a death sentence as it used to be. And it did used to be a death sentence because they didn't have medicines to suppress the virus, but now they have medicines that suppress the virus. I went from taking 16 pills twice a day to taking one pill once a day. Advanced. I love it. Yes. Um, And... Another revelation, which we, which is what we talking about, and what you talk yeah, about. Right. That Let's talk about it. It's called um, you, uh, U equals U, which is undetectable means untransmittable. This is a revelation that has come up within the last uh, has be, been made popular. I would say within the last seven or so years, I might be wrong about that, but recently. Because a lot of, even a lot of doctors still don't know about it. If you are undetectable, meaning if you take your medicine and the medicine is doing what it's supposed to do, killing the virus in your blood and suppressing it to, so it doesn't replicate, you're not detectable. Meaning when I go to the doctor and get my blood drawn, they don't detect HIV in my blood. Now, it does not mean it's not there. It just means it's so low that it can't be detected by a test. Understood. Makes what sense. that also means, though, is that I could have unprotected sex and not transmit it to my partner. Okay. And so then I think the question is, what are your choices now? Like, how do you structure your choices now with all of the information, the empowerment that you've given yourself and we're you know, blessed with having all these folks around you that, and also divine guidance that kind of nudged you around to the right places to get you where you are today? how do you choose to structure the ways in which you have sexual relations with other folks? Yes. So uh, (laughs) I choose to, um, you know, I always tell my partners that I'm living with HIV from um, the jump before we have any sex. And if they are fine with that, if they are accepting of that, we have conversations about their lifestyle, you know, 
I want to make sure that my partner, if um, you're going to be with me, I want to make sure you are going to the doctor every day. Not every day. <laughs> I want to make sure you go to the doctor at least once a year. Yeah. And if we choose to have unprotected sex, I want you to go get an HIV test at least once every six months. Not because I think you're going to get it, just because anything can happen and I want to be safe. Also, you can be going out there and sit, have sex with somebody else and bringing something back to me. So I need to make sure I'm keeping myself safe as well. That is so correct. I am getting tested as well but i require my partners to get tested at least once every six months have a go to a regular doctor once every year um and we have a we make decisions so typically i don't have unprotected sex unless i am in a i feel like i am in a relationship um with someone or i'm not gonna sit up here and lie i'm i, I just really like the way they look and i just want to I just want to, I just, I want it. Yeah. (laughs) And if you have, and I think that the most important aspect of this whole thing is that you are having the open and honest communication where the other person involved has full autonomy and full sovereignty to make their own choices. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing here because I know so many people, even watching this, even though I have a very open-minded audience, because they have to be to be anywhere near me, um, is that somebody might say, oh, well, I would never have sex with somebody who has HIV or I would never, I would never, I would never. Um, and the only thing that's fine to have that opinion. But the thing is, is that if someone gives you a choice, like that's your choice. And so don't, uh, my, uh, I guess my opinion is that it would be very helpful to not judge anyone for the decisions that they make within their own paradigm, within their own open and honest communication, because it's not yes. about you. It's about what other folks, and that's kind of what this whole, series that I'm putting together here is about is that although the people that all are watching this might not fully understand or fully, you know, assimilate what's happening. The whole point is we all have our own ability to choose. And as long as open, honest communication is at the foundation of that, it's not up to you or me or anyone else to decide what's okay for you, me to decide for you or you to decide for me. And that's kind of the essence of of all of this. So I love that you're sharing this. (laughs) <laughs> yes so I think a few things people I mean people judge all the time people like you know y'all should just have sex with each other <laughs> I actually I someone know. said to me oh is there an app I was, I was talking it's like sounds like is there an app for folks who have HIV or HIV positive so that they can you know keep it in their own community I'm like I don't know but that's, there is. it is that probably there is. I don't know N- none of the people who vibrate like I vibrate are on that app <laughs> or I haven't found them yet so. yep I really don't use that. I really don't use that app anymore. It's been years, but there is an app, but that doesn't mean you're going to, just because you have the same disease. disease I understand. You don't love or care or want to be with a person just because of that. So why limit your options when you don't have to? Because nope. you don't have to, like there are, there's no, right now I've been undetectable for years. Like I've been doing health good with my medicine for years. So I've been undetectable for years. Why would it be, um, why would I limit myself to just people who have the same thing as me? Because when I can't transmit it to anybody, so that, that wouldn't be smart, but people judge and say things like that. People say, um, you know, men are not going, or, you know, there are men be like, I would never, I've been dating for, I've been single for um, a lot of years. <laughs> I've been single for about, uh, let's say 10 years with a few blips in between. And um, I haven't, I've only in, in that 10 years out of how many other dates or how many other relationships I've been through, I've probably only had not probably. I've only had two men to say I can't deal with that. Okay. And it was fine. Sure. Um, so, you know, I'll say I have the conversation. If I feel like I am um, interested in sleeping with the person or I feel like our relationship is moving towards that, um, those experiences, I then decide to have a conversation with them. I have conversation in a public place because you never know how one may act. That is 
can I just really quick highlight how smart that is? Like how somebody might not ever even think that actually, in fact, the opposite, because it's such a personal topic and because it's such a private thing that they might really want to have it in a hush hush or in their own home. But exactly what you said is so, so important. And it's also the reason why, and it's not the same thing, but it's comparable where if I meet someone, which well now in COVID, I'm, I'm too scared to meet people on Tinder anymore. But um, because I don't believe anybody's like vaccination card. And then meanwhile, if you're on Tinder, but this is me judging, because if I'm not going around sleeping with everybody, but I'm thinking if it's a guy, they're up out there probably sleeping with three ladies before they meet me that day. But all that being said is that you might think that having it in a private place is right. I will never meet someone from an app at a private place ever. I don't care how much texting we've done. I don't care how much video chatting we've done before we've met. I will never meet someone, even if I know for sure that my intention is to have sex with them, I will never meet them anywhere except a very public place first. And that is so important. I want to really drive that in because you, like you said, especially in your situation, they might freak out. They might try to hurt you. They might try to write. So happy you said that. Such yes. an important point. Yeah. So I made sure it's a public place. Um, I made sure someone knows where I'm at, all of those good things. Um, and I have the conversation. And it is totally, you know, I also like to take a few days, take a few days and think about it. Because what I was finding out is men would be like, oh, that ain't nothing. Okay. And then little um they'll be having you know little questions here and there and I'll be like you know we should have had more conversation about mm-hmm. it so I tell people to take a few days you have questions let me know if you decide not to do it that's fine um you I actually tell them you know you don't have to contact me no more if you decide not to do it and it's not because that's just a way for me to deal with rejection mm. um I had to learn how to deal with rejection because rejection is the Hard, it was the hardest part about this for me. So I had to learn how to deal with rejection. And that was my way. Just cut it off completely. Don't, I like you, but don't do all that. I don't need all that. Cause that just prolongs my yeah. process. So um, I would tell them not to do it. And then, you know, we would move on. But one thing I learned about um, in the process is, some men would say they were fine with it. And even if we use a condom, they would like get up immediately and just like aggressively be cleaning and washing. That made me feel some type of way. Understandable. Well, so I learned from that to have a conversation about this. Like if you are truly not comfortable with this, if you don't understand the science of this, then I need you to not, let's not do this because- it'll make me feel a, a way and I don't want to feel that way. Do you think therapy helped you get to this point? Because the way, so for where I'm sitting, the level of self-awareness that you're expressing in the ways that you choose to communicate this to other people that you're going to possibly have sex with is so high level emotional intelligence, so high level energetic intelligence, so high level of self-awareness. Do you feel the therapy helped you with that? Or were you just kind of always in that mind space of really being thorough with understanding how things might make you feel? It's not just making them feel comfortable, understanding the repercussions that might make you feel uncomfortable and then making sure you mitigate those so you don't have to deal. That is, it's just beautiful. Like it just, it is. Yes. I mean, I had some of this, like I was very confident before all of this happened. Um, I wasn't very verbal. I wasn't, I didn't communicate very well because I kind of grew up with a like speak when spoken to type of mentality. Mm -hmm. So I was very quiet, but therapy definitely helped me um, understand that my feelings matter and I needed to communicate that. Um, Therapy helped me be more selfish than I've ever been. In the and best I, way possible. Yes, in the best way possible. So because I've never been a selfish person, but therapy helped me understand that you have to be in order to maintain your sanity. You have to think about you. So yes, therapy is, I credit therapy. I credit therapy with changing my life for the best. And I tell people to do it all the time. Me too. <laughs> me too. As our coach says, see the lady. That's what, yes. that's what she, yeah. <laughs> that's what she said. She's like, go see the lady. Just, she's like, 
not what I'm here for. Go see the lady. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, you know, communicate all of those things. Um, and for the last like eight years, things have been great. Any man I meet, I communicate all these things. I will tell you the one um, thing that they all have in common that they say about me is um, it was your confidence. It was your presentation. Energy, yeah. It was how you are living your life that made me confident enough to know that you were okay. That you, what you were telling me was, one, it's hard to tell somebody the truth. That. Two, you gave me rules. <laughs> you put down boundaries. You said, if I don't do this, you won't do this. So I've heard that from different <laughs> men. Um, and as I started hearing that, um, that meant, let me know that I was on the right track and doing the right thing. And then, you know, if somebody says no, or they can't deal with it, I'd be like, that's your, you was fine. And I really wanted to take you down, but that's your, sorry for you, oh sir. Oh my God, I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> sorry for you, sir. Oh, I love you. <laughs> oh my God. That is, uh, I had, so I did not know, like, so just kind of for people who are watching, Ebony and I have never actually had a one-on-one -on -one conversation prior to right now. Like we've, <laughs> we've been in community with each other, but we've never actually had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I am so uplifted by this conversation. Like I honestly don't have the words to fully express it <laughs> just yet, but your, your level of energy and empowerment is making me feel even more empowered. And I'm an empowered person. Uh, <laughs> like, so I, yeah, I just thank you for your honesty, your willingness to be vulnerable and understanding that being vulnerable doesn't make you weak. It makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just so amazing. And I'm so grateful to have had this conversation and kind of before we bring it around, like, is there any other, you know, anything else you want to share or any other like advice that you maybe wish you would have had, or just anything that you kind of would want to close out this amazing conversation with? I mean, I just want to tell people like, don't like people living with HIV are human human sexual beings. Of course. Sex is a beautiful, powerful healing tool. It can be Damn. if you do it right. Um, and judging creates an internal stigma to people sometimes to prevent them from doing it. And I think if people understood, like, don't your judgments can be stopping somebody from living their best life. So don't do that. Secondly, people living with HIV can have sex um, without transmitting it. Um, and this was a big one for, for females. Anytime somebody got in my inbox, they would be you know, and wanted to say something crazy for whatever reason. Um, I would tell women, you are saying. You know, I don't know why someone would want to have sex with you and you're, you're HIV positive or he didn't do this or he didn't do that, but he did. There are a lot of men out there who are having sex with women living with HIV. They break up with them and then they come have, or they don't break up with them and they come have sex with you. And you are on this high hog up horse, but there's a great possibility that you've had sex with a man who's had, who, who's had a lot of sex a lot of, with a woman living with HIV and you won't even require him to go to the doctor so stop judging like just don't do it I mean yeah. if that's not the best advice period because that's it judgment is not it's not our place to judge another person's life experience period hard stop no but and well if this is no this is not your life and I find personally that the folks who are the quickest to judge and the quickest to have something to say are the ones that have the least amount of respect for themselves, the least amount of love for themselves, and the least amount of willingness to actually sit with what's real in their own lives so that they don't feel the need to be externally attacking other people's life choices because you need to be just worrying about what's going on in here, not what everybody else is doing. Best advice ever, yeah. really. And I, I always uh, end it with, 
I didn't, um, I contracted HIV because I was in love. If you are in love or if you love someone, if you are in lust and you're lusting after someone and you just want to take somebody down, get tested. You should have a regular testing routine because I, agree. I don't care if you're married. I don't care if you're dating. I don't care what you're doing. If you are having sex, unprotected sex, you should be getting tested. No matter who you are, you can contract HIV. So get tested, be healthy, all of those things. And continue to do what you're doing but um you know people always think only people get hiv are people who are promiscuous i was in love <laughs> love i tell a uh, love is what is why i got hiv because i love that man so much i took the condom off to have a baby with him and i ended up with hiv so uh I just want one side note, totally off topic, but not really. My favorite thing is that you you call it take somebody down. I'm using that forever. I'm using that from this moment on. I'm, I'm going to talk to my husband. I'm like, I don't know who's going to get taken down next. Because <laughs> that's my. Like, <laughs> yes, I, I like me and I, girl. especially black, to me, black men are like gods. And I look at them and I'd be like, Lord, I want to take them down. I talk, I talk to the Lord about it. Lord, uh, hey, man, the Lord is. The reason why we feel this way so You're like i want to take them down you you made them preach <laughs> <laughs> so okay that's the best way we could possibly end this ebony this has been a, a fantastic amazing beautiful there's not enough words conversation for me i look forward to sharing this outwardly with the world and whoever this goes and however this travels and um and also to continue being in community with you and yes. yeah Thank you. Just thank you. Welcome. Thank you. This has been great. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Well, for everybody watching, I hope you got something amazing out of this conversation because it was just filled with gems of how to be a good human being. And um, yeah, thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next episode of Real Life Sex. Have a great day.